Look at the rook. It's a bowl like this. And the horse needs to drink water <laughs> from the bowl. So every time she said, oh, look, it needs some water, you know, and that's why the knight should be beside the rook. And I think this is fantastic. Uh, now I always use this when I teach the small children, though. The children are some water, yes. And like this. Uh, so that's why the knight should be. You should know that my children, I have four children. When I come to the schools, they always tell me, when I teach their classes chess, they say, can you skip this with the knight drinks the balls? Because it's so embarrassing for us when you do it like this, you know. But, you know, I think the more crazy rules, the more you remember. So children will never miss this. Then the next problem is if it's the queen or is the king, you know. And I don't know what you say, but in Swedish we say that the queen likes its color. You say that? But actually in English they have a better way to say it. They say that the queen wants the dress to match the shoes. You, you know, I think that's much more clever, you know, but uh, you, can, you can choose yourself. So that's the way to do it. Okay. Then I also think that very early, maybe you know, in the fifth lessons, I teach the children the language of chess. And they love that when I say that. And normally also, when I come to children that is maybe six or seven years old, I come into the classroom, I tell the teacher that chess is a coordinate system they get very worried because they say, wait, 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 wait. Not until they are nine years old or 10 years old, we teach them this. But then I say, okay, look at this. This is how I teach them. I say that this is the A street. This is the B street, C street, D street, and so on. And this is the number of the street. And I ask the children, where do you live? And at least in Sweden, we have the name of the street first and then the number afterwards. I don't know how you have it in Slovak or in the other countries, but it, it's the same. Then all children know, first you say the name of the street and then the number of the street. And it will take them about 10 seconds to understand the coordinate system. And the teacher get amazed because this one, usually they, you know, they use a lot of time to explain this for kids. And now it's very simple. I just say, what is this square? What is the name? And this is the street, G Street, and it's number seven. So easy. And after that, you can start to discuss chess with the children very naturally, very easily. So, and of course, also you can have games with the name of the street, you know, uh, identify the color of the uh, square. I also think this is, a lot of children think this is very funny to, to realize what color it has got. You can have these kind of games, name the squares. Then, a little bit further on, uh, I also teach them the values of the pieces. You know, the pawn is one piece, uh, is one point, of course, and you know, as all, the, all of you are chess players, you know uh, the value of the pieces. Actually, I must ask you, what, how much is the queen worth in your country? Is it nine? nine. It's at nine, huh? Mm -hmm. Because you know, in, it's ten in your country. Because in, I know only, I only know two countries. In that case, it's your country and it's Norway. They say the queen is ten. It's crazy. <laughs> because for me, it's nine, you know? So I think it's so strange. In different countries, it's worth different. Because it is nine. It is worth nine. It was ten. You see, that's why I ask because it's a bit, it's a bit interesting. This with the value of the queen. Okay. Anyway, the standard is nine, but of course, in your country, there might be ten. The ladies are more appreciated in your country. Still, you know, you can do some exercises if you have this, but also evaluating. I think this is a great step forward in your chess understanding when you can say that if I lose my rook taking this bishop, I will lose some points. Suddenly you understand a little bit more. Okay, now we go into chess didactics two. So, like I said, I think that 
what we talk about now is not about developing chess skills primarily, but actually to develop skills for life or skills that you can use in other school subjects. And like I said, for me, this with concentration is a key. So when I say we make a room of concentration, it's quite interesting. A lot, a lot of schools also in Sweden, they have now designed this chess room and they say it's a concentration room. That means that in this room, it should always be more quiet. It's a room you can go and study. It should be more relaxed atmosphere and not, not so high talking and so on. And when the children come to the room, even sometimes the, the teacher stands in the door and says hello to the child when it goes in, like a ritual. And after that, they get more concentrated when it goes in. I don't know if this is great, but I, I just realized that there, I think that, it, at least in Sweden, it's a need of a room for concentration to train this ability. And you can do this in different ways to train the ability to concentrate. But uh, one thing is, of course, this with the rules, like the, uh, the code of behavior. I think this is a key to it if you want the children to be able to concentrate. And uh, yes, you saw this code of behavior that we walked through uh, before, how to behave, how to do it. Because I also believe that one of the great wins with using chess is to learn this to show respect. Not only this with shake hands that we have, but also to train them how to win graciously. You know, I, I never allow children to uh, pick on other ones when they lose or something like that. There should be a grace into this. And I explain it to them like this. In chess, someone must win and someone must lose. That means that the loser is just as important as the winner, because otherwise there would be no winner. So you should show respect to the one that loses the game. And of course, also if you lose, you should uh, accept it with dignity. And then we come to sporting behavior. I think also chess is a great way of, of, of learning how to behave when, when you sport. You know. There should be, of course, no cheating. We, we all know we have some problems in chess these days with the computers uh, and the telephones and so on. But still, I think ch chess, is, the feeling is that it's a very clean sport in many ways. You should, of course, have a genuine desire to win your game, but you should never disturb your opponent, never cheat, never comment on other games, and of course not that can happen when the children are a little bit stronger, you know, make offer of draws repeatedly and so on. This is behavior that we who plays chess knows that how, this is how to behave in a good way. You don't do like that. Another thing is this with alternating terms, you know. You should learn how to be patient. You stay at the table in a, with a good manner. You do not hurry your opponent. When I say stay at the table, of course, when it's your move. You, do, you don't go away by then. You never hurry your opponent to make a move. And uh, of course, think if, if when it's your opponent to move, that's a good way of thinking. And then it's your own turn. It's calculating time. That's the classical way of seeing it. Then we have this with the touch move rules. If you touch a piece, you must move it. As long as you're still touching a piece, the move is not finished, uh, and so on. Uh, and then you have this little shadow. Uh, of course, you all know this rule uh, that you can say, I just want to put my pieces in the right place. Again, it's a good way to train the children how to behave correct. So, now to this with chess thinking. This is something I've been you know, working a lot with, not the least when I was a chess trainer, or when I'm doing that, but also this for children. What kind of different thinking skills do we train with chess? And at least these are four that I think is great to know about when it comes to chess thinking. First, when it comes with memory. You all know that, uh, first of all, when it comes to openings, for example, you have to know lines by heart. You know, like the right locals, you just know the, the moves, how to start. Then you need also to understand techniques.
to remember different techniques to use in different parts of, of a game, like this Velozina position from an end game. Then we come to this that I think is the most important thing for if you want to become better in chess is to remember different patterns. Right now, there is a huge debate of this importance of pattern recognition. Always what you do when you train something, you learn different patterns and how to use them in different situations. And the more patterns you know, the more patterns you recognize, the better chess player you will become. So I believe if you want to become a good chess player, pattern recognition is the key. The more patterns you recognize, then you will be uh, a better chess player. And I guess most of you will find the checkmate in this position. It's a pattern you will recognize. We all know queen c4 check, and then knight f7, knight h6, queen to g8, and knight to f7. As you are strong chess players, you will, you will know this. You know. And if you are a chess player, you recognize this immediately. You can see that, oh, okay, here we have a knight, it's time for this smoother remains. The pattern comes to you and you will find the solution. But to do that, to be able to find the right patterns, I usually say, what you do as a chess player or you, what you do is to collect your bag, your rucksack of patterns. The bigger rucksack you have, the better chess player you become if you can take it out of your rucksack at the right time. And the best way to do that is to use the rule of thumbs. What do I mean with rule of thumbs? Because I use this also when I train talents or very good when you're like grandmasters and so on, but you just put it on another level. The very beginner use grab free material. That's uh, like uh, um, this quote, this guideline. Then of course you can use take if you gain. Should I take this piece? Yes, if I gain, I should do it. It's also something to remember, a rule of thumb. What you can do if you are unsure, would my attack be uh, successful? You can count attackers and defenders. You can also have like this type. The queen starts with a small step. These are more r rules for the opening, you know. Open the big door, e4, d4. Don't block other pieces when you go out. Don't move same piece twice. Develop your pieces on active squares. The queen starts with a small step. Knight before the bishop. Put your king into safety. These kind of rule of thumbs the children should bring with them to the game and it will be easier for them to find the right thinking when they do it. Could be like this. Connect the rooks, put rooks on open files, put rook opposite the opponent's queen, get the rook to the seventh rank, put rooks behind past pounds. The more of those rule of thumbs that, that are categorized, the easier it is to find the right uh, part in your rooksack to use when you play. So I think that rules of thumb is a very important thing for a chess player to use. If you're a beginner or if you want to be a strong chess player. And like I said, best be beginner advice, grab free material. Ask yourself, which piece can I take? Can I take without being taken back? It's quite funny because when I, when I do this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, rule of thumbs, a lot of teachers re rename them because I said, grab free material, it sounds so boring. So instead, a lot of teachers call it birdie num num. The birdie num num trick or free is tasty. It's, they li the children likes it more. So you can choose yourself if you want to rephrase them to more funny stuff or if it should be the correct, more pedagogic correct approach like grab free material. So then comes to analysis. This is of course also very important um, for the chess thinking. And there are different parts in analysis. It's forcing moves. Normally that's the first thing that you look for the forcing moves. Then it's about visualization, what is about to happen in advance. You try to find candidate moves, 
what different moves is worth calculating at, and then you have different variations. If we come to forcing moves, I think again it's very good to have some small pedagogic tricks for the children. For example, uh, in not the least in the UK and England, they use this, and I like this a lot, the CCTV trick. Do you know that? The CCTV trick? It is first, when it's your move, you look for checks. Well, have I got any good checks to make? Then you look for captures. Is there any good captures? And then if you have no, no checks, no captures, maybe you can give a threat to a piece. And if you do that, you will win. You will have victory. So it's the CCTV trick. And a lot of children, I've seen the, the, the English players, maybe even if you go down and look in the, in the year eight, you know, the lowest uh, girls and boys in, in this class, look at the English players. I'm pretty sure some of them sit like this. CCTV, CCTV. You know, just to find out. Where can I check? Where can I capture? Can I make a threat? I will win. So, okay. I think this is good, a good way. Forcing moves, checks. Do you recognize this position? Kasparov. No. Carlson. Uh, uh, yes. Carlson, it's the final game uh, that, won. that he won uh, when he won, won the World Championship. Yes, Karyakin, that's correct. And, and you look at all the checks, you have a check here with the rook, but then the king takes it. You have the queen check here. What happens then? If the checkmate. king takes, checkmate here. If the pawn takes, it's checkmate here. So it's what's a fantastic ending. Again, the, ch the eight year old English child would have found this immediately because they look at the checks first. CCTV, good, a good way. Okay, then you have the captures. Uh, now we have a little bit more difficult position here. Uh, how does white restore the material balance? What do you say? What is the best best move for uh, for uh, white in this position? What should white play? Sorry, bishop e6 or knight e6? What what do you say? What is the white best white move here? You see, black is a, is, a, is a piece up for the time being. There is only one way to solve this. Knight h5. Knight h5. Then you can move this one, can't you? To... Queen g3. Queen g3 check. King h8. And then you can take with the queen on c3. That is the solution. Okay, this is a difficult position again. It's not for children, beginners, but I thought you are a little bit stronger chess players here, so it is suitable for you. Okay, and then you can, of course, if you have a threat, is it a threat to take the pawn on h2? Probably a lot of you will recognize this position again. Spassky Fischer. This is, yes, of course, this is uh, the Spassky Fischer position from Reykjavik 1972. Black took on h2 and lost the game, even though it might have been a draw, but uh, it was not easy. So again, forcing moves, threats, is there a threat or not in the position? So, now analysis and visualization. And this is actually quite interesting, because when I explain chess to, for example, a mathematics teacher, or to also to principals and so on, and they say to me, why is chess good for children? Then I explain this visualization that what you have to do is to foresee what is about to happen. And this is important in almost all uh, different subjects, but not the least in mathematics, to be able to calculate without having it concrete in front of you. But this abstract, more complex thinking Chess is a great way to train that. And what I do is normally I use the dream position idea and the ideal sequence to reach the dream position. And what do I mean with that? For example, in this position, uh, again, this is a bit more difficult position than I use for small kids. Uh, in this position, it's why to move. 
And here I think it's great to think about to find a dream position for white. What would be a dream position for white and what is the ideal sequence to reach this dream position? Sorry? Bones to come to X6. Yes, if you could have this pawn here to reach H6, white will win. No? But then, actually, it's not so easy. There is an interesting line, but for sure, if the pawn could reach this, it's a dream position to reach. So, what can black do? The only way is to try to block it like this, you know? And now, white has got the great move. White can continue with the idea by just playing the queen to f6. And then in the next move, the pawn here will reach h6. Again, a bit more difficult position, but shows that, uh, that also these more easier rule of thumbs can be used also for good players. They are, can be used all over your career. You just learn the right way. So, the dream position, the theme continues. Now, we come to this with candidate moves. I, all of these, the memory, the forcing moves, as you could see, the visualization, everything can be used also for beginners. Even though my examples are more advanced, you can have much more easier positions that can show the same idea, but more suitable for your group. Candidate groups. This is also a great way for, to show the complexity of how you train your brain when you play chess. And I showed this to some principles, and they say this is great for the way, uh, the process of how to think when you, when you do something. You find a move that you want, you find some moves that you want to play. Let's say four options like this. These are the candidate moves. I can play this move, this move, this move, this move. You start with the first one, start to analyze. Does it work? No. It was not good. I try again. You take option two. Does it work? No. Try again. Option three. Does it work? Yes. But maybe there is a better one. And you find option four. It is better. You play it. This kind of sequence is used not only in chess, but can be used in other situations as well. When you find out how to deal with different problems you have in schools and in life. So, analysis of variations, then it's more like calculation. If you come to mathematics again, a straightforward way of calculation, and here you can also see, maybe you can find the winning sequence. We are back to the smoother main idea. And again, here you can see how these kind of variations can be connected to patterns. Do you see the way white should play? Rook, okay. Okay. Rook takes here, yes. queen takes here, Knight queen takes here, king here, knight h7, king g8, knight h6, queen down, and then it's checkmate. Now it's a long force variation, but still, it's the same pattern as we saw before. And he, but she believes that probably one of the best things with chess is that you need to be self-aware of what you do. Because, not the least, it's also this perspective taking, that when you make a move, you must calculate with that your opponent is going to make a move. And what you need to do is to think before you move, what can your opponent do? And do not touch a piece unless you intend to move it, it's also about something that a lot of children need to learn. Think first, move later. You know, this process of think first and move later, this rule tra trains this part. Make a final check before you move. Am I winning or losing or level? You may need to make a judgment all the time of your position. What is my opponent trying to do? Quite a lot of children also, you know, you know that, not the least when they are small, they go up and they stand behind their opponents to see the position from another perspective. And this with perspective taking, also something that the, chi uh, that the children will train through chess. And then of course, am I playing too quickly, as you could, as you could see here? It's also something. 
made a checkout. We let some teachers try out with these mini games ideas that we have. And we could find out that a lot of these trainers and chess teachers, they found it very useful to use this mini games idea. That's why we have pushed it forward into this course as well. Because we find out that the results have been so well with chess, uh, with these mini games and chess variants. And I wanted now you to try out a, a new way uh, to do this. And actually now, what we are going to do is to play the ladder. How many of you is using this, the ladder? Do you use this? Because I think this is such an easy way to do, uh, to do a chess, uh, chess tournament. It is like you can put up like this. Oh, but I think you should take them out, Stanislav, here for me. Aha, uh -huh, it's names. Oh, I see, okay, we do it like this then. So uh, we have here different, uh, the, all the, the participants of our group like this. This is a bit difficult. Steps below someone, you can challenge. You can always check or you can always challenge someone above yourself, but you can never challenge someone below yourself. And if you win the game, when you play a game, then you will come just above this person. You put up your own name just above this person. I will show you in practice when it's up on, on, um, on, on this one. And what you're going to do is to play three different more uh, mini games. First, it's this rook against five pawns. Then it's two knights versus eight pawns. I tell you a bit about that. And then we come to a homecoming chess that is my favorite um, uh, mini game, I think. And for example, if, if Andrei Stankovic is challenging uh, Fratichek, and uh, if Andrei wins, he will come up like this, go over to this, just above Fratichek, and the last one here will come to the other group, like this, okay? Uh, and if, what about if in this position, for example, like this, if it is like this that, um, uh, in this position, that Fratichek is winning this game, then nothing happens. They just stand the way, some way. What is good with this ladder is that I normally use it for children because they can do this tournament themselves. So they normally have this in breaks during the school day, for example. So you can just put them up on the wall in the classroom or outside the classroom the children themselves in the breaks during the day, they challenge each, each others, and then they play the game and they change place in this kind of, of ladder. What I do is that I usually do it like this magnetic part. I buy this one like this. What is also very good with this is that if you have all your children that you have in your group in this way, it's very easy to prepare a pairing. David plays against Gary, and they put up all the names of the children. And you can also arrange a tournament like this, with this magnetic uh, solution. So I think this is a, a great investment to use this kind of stuff. Also, this game is very interesting from a real theoretical chess point of view. But for kids, they will more learn how the rook moves, and not the least, how to move your pawns in the best way. Okay? Shake hands and start, please. So for the beginners, they just find out how does the pieces move, how to, and so on. But for the good players, it could be like a task. Analyze who is really winning. They start to analyze like this and looking back and forth and so on. So it's a good way if you have this group of very different strength. Okay, next game is this game. It's eight pawns against two knights. And in this game, you should know, you play two times. One time with the pawns and one time with the knights. And you see who can make most pawns to the other side. As soon as you are on the other side with a pawn, you are safe. But why do I like this mini game? It's because there is a great little story to this uh, little mini game. And it's actually, uh, it's Boris Brun from Germany. He's a great pedagogue. 
who invented this little, uh, this little mini game. And it tells the story like this. In a little town of Germany, there was going to be a big party, okay? Eight, eight farmers, eight pawns, wanted to go to the party, but they were not invited to the party, and they have their wrong shoes on. In the doorway to the party, they have two very tough guards, two black knights. What to do, the pawns said. Well, after thinking, they say, we run as much as we can, and we try to reach the other side with as many as possible. And they started to run, and the guards tried to protect the party. And now the question is, how many did really make it? How many get into the party? And that's what we're going to see now. You play one time with white, one time with black, and you see how many of your friends that can reach the party and how many you can chase away in this little mini game. Okay? Rook on C1, bishop on D1, knight on E1, rook on F1, queen on G1, and knight on H1, and the other black pieces are just opposite of the white ones. Please. Now, what we have done now so far is to look at mini games that one is step by step towards traditional chess. Okay, first pawns cross the board, add more pieces and so on, and you come to classical chess. Then we have training situations with a piece against pawns, just to train how to move the piece and how to move the pawns. What has been good with all of these uh, small mini games, what is be good with these mini games is that you can play on different levels. You can be a beginner, but you can also be quite a strong player and still enjoy the game. This is the same. I think this is a lovely chess variant that you can use when the children know how the pieces should be in the start-up position. In this game, it is like this. Black. Uh, white starts the game, and the goal is to reach the starting position of a chess game. There no no. Shh. You listen? So white starts, black one makes one move, white makes one move, and so on. White always starts the game. The one reaching the start up position first will win. That means that white should win this game, okay? White should win this game. In, uh, first of all, for the beginner in this game, is to remember where is the pieces in the start-up position of a chess game. But <coughs> for a bit stronger player, you also need to have a plan. How do you reach the start-up position as fast as possible? That gives it a little bit more complexity to this position. Do you understand what to do? White starts and you have to play it back to the start position of a chess game. But not crossing the center line. But you don't cross the center line so they can't take each other. That's very important, of course. So you cannot take the other pieces and you cannot cross this one. The number four, like this. You cannot take the opponent's pieces, you cannot cross this line, and the black pieces cannot cross this line. Now from eight to five, it's the uh, area that the black pieces is moving. So please start the game. So for example, how do you do this as good as possible? First you could prove Trump could place the queen here to go there. Then you should open the route, and then this knight could maybe go here, and this... Uh, 
you need to find the right way. One, two, three, four. One, two, I guess is the best route. So, okay, let's do it like this. Go here, go here, go here, go here, go here. And now it's time to clear again. Here, in one move, you go here, you go here, you go here, you go here. You go here, here, and here, and it's a clear route. Huh? But again, always planning how to do things ahead. And the, I think this is a great game to do that. It's again a variation that is, can be played both by very beginners and those that are a bit stronger chess players. I think it's a good game for that.